Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and I'm here for the fourth session of our course in T.S. Eliot. Today we'll take up Sweeney Among the Nightingales, uh, one of T.S. Eliot's quatrain poems. Uh, during World War II and, excuse me, World War I, I should say, and shortly after, he wrote a number of poems in a traditional style. Quatrains of four lines, a regular meter, and a rhyme scheme. Virtually always, when he uses that style, it is for the purpose of sarcasm, deep irony, through the poem. Uh, in this case, Sweeney Among the Nightingales represents the opposite situation of J. Alfred Prufrock. That is, instead of a sensitive, inhibited, uh, figure prostrated, uh, like a patient spread out on the table. Uh, Sweeney is a man of action. Uh, he is, of course, a man who, unlike J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, is mindless. He's an animal man, and thereby is a man of action. You might say he is that pair of ragged claws that can reach out and grab whatever he wants, uh, which Prufrock, to some degree, envied. Now, we can see at once that there is something incongruous about the title. Sweeney among the nightingales, a man with that name has no business being among nightingales. So once again, we have the theme of realism versus romance, with the deck stacked very heavily against romance. We should begin with a nightingale legend. Uh, from ancient times, and particularly in Ovid's poem, Metamorphoses, we have the story of Philomela, a young woman who was raped by King Tereus, and to keep her quiet, he cut out her tongue and cut off her hands so she could not write about what she had suffered. The gods took pity on this girl and turned her into a nightingale who sings sadly through the night about her tragedy. In the poem, the nightingales will turn out to be women in a house of prostitution, which uh, Sweeney is visiting to serve his needs. He doesn't have any needs beyond that, being the animal man. The epigraph to this poem in Greek is from one of the greatest tragedies of antiquity, Aeschylus's trilogy, the Oresteian trilogy, in which the first play is the Agamemnon. At the end of that play, Agamemnon dies, murdered by his wife and her lover. And these are Agamemnon's last words, translated into English as, I am mortally wounded. So, as usual, the past is superior to the present in Eliot's work. We move from a genuine great epic hero of antiquity, the conqueror of Troy, being murdered by his wife and her lover at the end of that great conquest. We move from that to Sweeney. He's the best we have for an epic figure. Certainly jail for Prufrock won't do. That patient etherized on a table. At least this is a man of action. Eliot introduces Sweeney with animal imagery, blatantly. Ape neck Sweeney spreads his knees, letting his arms hang down to laugh. The zebra stripes along his jaw, swelling to maculate giraffe. What happens next confuses many readers, but I think it's best understood in terms of Eliot's sarcastic purpose. The next six lines are perfect mock epic. In our time, we cannot have epic literature as you had back in the time of Homer or even in the time of Milton and Shakespeare and Spencer and the Fairy Queen. Uh, with the naturalistic view of life, man is merely an evolving animal and a pretty lowly one at that if you look at Sweeney. Uh, we can't have epic poetry. The best we can do is mock epic. 
So we pretend that this is an epic poem about a tragedy that will befall our epic hero, Sweeney, when the narrative begins. Meanwhile, we'll usher in our epic hero, Sweeney, with a blast of fanfare, uh, the blowing of trumpets, the roll of drums. Uh, namely, uh, the way all of nature holds its breath in horror at what's going to happen to the epic hero as though this were, let's say, the thunderstorm in King Lear, or uh, some other uh, instance from antiquity, uh, the uh, um, terrible night that befalls Rome before Caesar is, is murdered and so forth. Here then, bringing on Sweeney down the red carpet, the circles of the stormy moon slide westward toward the river plate. Death and the raven drift above, and Sweeney guards the horned gate. Some scholars suspect that the horned gate would represent Sweeney's genitalia. That might be possible. Uh, you had in antiquity two gates, the ivory gate, which were the gates to dream, a fantasy, and the horn, the gates of horn, uh, would represent a more realistic view uh, during one's uh, nightly a session in the arms of Morpheus. We proceed with more of this mock epic, looking to the sky, gloomy Orion and the dog are veiled, a bad sign, and hushed the shrunken seas. The very sea is holding its breath in horror at what's going to happen to our epic hero. So what does happen? What happens is a farcical story. We begin with Sweeney sitting with a girl on his lap. Uh, the person in the Spanish cape tries to sit on Sweeney's knees, slips and pulls a tablecloth, overturns a coffee cup, and on the floor she yawns and draws a stocking up. Now, in modern literature, the artist does not tell us what's going on. We have to figure it out. So we try to make a plausible reading, putting the pieces together. And what's most plausible here, I think, is that gesture of yawning and pulling a stocking up on the part of this girl is a signal to the bouncer in this establishment who shows up in the next lines. The silent man in mocha brown sprawls at the windowsill and gapes. He realizes that was a signal. He's supposed to do something. Can't quite remember what it is. Give him a few minutes to think about it. And while we are waiting, the uh, waiter brings in some indecent fruit, bananas, figs, hothouse grapes. All of them have certain risque connotations. Now the man in the brown suit, the silent vertebrate. In a naturalistic world, we know man is a vertebrate, uh, not too sure we can claim much more than that to his credit. The silent vertebrate in brown contracts and concentrates, withdraws. That man in the brown suit remembers the job he has to do. Meanwhile, in um, the foreground, the madam of this house, Rachel Ney Rabinovich. She's obviously Jewish. She would join Sweeney and other low-class people, most of them recent immigrants, as objects of disdain for T.S. Eliot and his upper-class Boston blue blood type of uh, uh, compeers. Uh, this woman then, being low class, she's just another animal figure. She tears at the grapes, not with hands, as Prufrock would have, but with murderous paws. Now the narrative ends there, but um, we are left to infer what happens. And I think it's most likely that that man in the brown suit, who will reappear in a moment, slugs Sweeney with a blackjack, knocks him unconscious, and robs him. Uh, the next stanza, in any case, um, 
says that the madam, Rachel Rubinovich, and that girl uh, in the cape, she and the lady in the cape, a suspect thought to be in league. Yes, there's a conspiracy against Sweeney. And what would be more logical than in a low-class whorehouse, he is slugged and robbed. Uh, and so that man in the brown suit, now he, now that he remembers what he's supposed to do, he pretends he's just another customer. He um, declines the gambit, that is, turns down the fruit that the waiter brought in. He pretends he's tired, he shows fatigue. He leaves the room and reappears. Outside the window, leaning in, branches of wisteria, a beautiful blue, fragrant, romantic flower, circumscribe this man's face with his golden grin. Now, we're not told what happens at that moment, but as I say, it stands to reason that he would reach in with a black jack behind Sweeney, knock him out, and they would rob the man. The last two stances of Sweeney among the nightingales show, I think, Sweeney gradually resuming consciousness, presumably as he lies on the floor. He hears voices. The host, that would be Rachel Rabinovich, with someone indistinct, converses at the door apart. We now bring on the romantic imagery from Agamemnon's time. The nightingales are singing. We could add to it a Christian reference. They are singing near the convent of the Sacred Heart, capital letters. In our naturalistic time, of course, uh, there's no such thing as a Sacred Heart. There's no convent that's credible dedicated to the Sacred Heart of our Savior. So what we'll have to do for us to replace the convent of the Sacred Heart would be a whorehouse. They do have certain resemblances, a um, establishment where women are cloistered to serve the needs of an outside community, in this case, the men who come and frequent this place. It'll have to do, just as Sweeney will have to do as an epic hero in our time. Genuine heroic action in an epic mode simply is not available to us because of this naturalistic view of life. As we end the poem, then, we continue with the nightingales. They sang within the bloody wood when Agamemnon cried aloud 3,000 years ago. Uh, but now, if we hear them singing, we will notice that they leave real droppings as the poem ends. They let their liquid siftings fall to stain the stiff, dishonored shroud. If Agamemnon were murdered today, his shroud might be covered with bird droppings. So as we end this poem, as always, realism prevails over romance, over the superior past when epic and heroic literature was possible. Uh, we'll end our look at Sweeney and the Nightingales now, and we'll go on to Portrait of a Lady in our next session.